Good afternoon, folks, and thank you all so much for joining me this afternoon. My name is Joe Long. I am the Curator of Education for South Carolina's Confederate Relic Room and Military Museum, the oldest and I think the finest military museum in the state. Come by and see us when the quarantine is over. But for now, we're gonna leave the museum and return to the beautiful Adriatic Sea for a history at home lesson about the leadership of a tremendous naval officer of the First World War, a man whose name you might very well know, but whose record you're probably unfamiliar with. And a guy I think that we have a lot to learn from. So without further ado, let's begin discussing the career of Captain Georg von Trapp, or Wetten Captain Georg Ludwig von Trapp, also known as the Dread of the Adriatic. But you probably know him as the daddy character from the well-known musical, The Sound of Music. Christopher Plummer sort of defined that role. And when you see Von Trapp in the musical, you see a, a man who is a, a, a bit of a martinet. He, uses a bosun's whistle to communicate with his children. Uh, you know that he has some kind of an interesting background, but the film goes into no details about it. And in scenes where he's in formal dress, like his wedding, you may notice he has some medals and a very distinctive medal around his neck. Uh, this medal is one of the only things he would carry with him when he crossed the Atlantic uh, to go to the United States. And that particular medal is called the Military Order of Maria Theresa. This, it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire's version of the uh, United States Medal of Honor the highest decoration for valor that we have, or like the British Victoria Cross. And in fact, the military order of Maria Theresa, when awarded, actually came with a noble title. When he was awarded this medal, Captain Georg von Trapp actually became Ritter, or Knight. He became, uh, he gained a noble title with this award for value. So the medals in the movie kind of look like, you know, special effects, uh, um, uh, just sort of bling on the outfit of Prince Charming, but they actually represented a tremendous amount of achievement and of courage and leadership in a distinguished naval career. The Order of Maria Theresa was specifically given for successful military acts of essential impact to a campaign that were undertaken on the officer's own initiative. In other words, you didn't get the Order of Maria Theresa for following orders. You got the Order of Maria Theresa for coming up with and executing a plan of your own and an especially dangerous one, one which no one would have blamed you for not trying. In fact, the sort of folklore about this award was that you got the Order of Maria Theresa for something that if it had failed, you would have gotten a court martial for. That is not strictly true, certainly not in Georg von Trapp's case, but it was a medal for men who thought and acted for themselves in leadership. 
And that's something we're gonna see distinguishing Captain Funk Trap throughout his career. He was born in 1880. His father was a naval officer who told many sea stories and uh, young Georg grew up hearing those and wishing to follow in his father's footsteps. He secured admission to the prestigious Austro-Hungarian Naval Academy as a naval cadet. And it's interesting what they thought in Austria made a good naval officer. He learned the things that you would expect, seamanship, navigation, naval history, not so much technology. Uh, he was very competent in handling a sailing ship by the time he was done with the academy. But also, Austrian naval officers had to learn to waltz very proficiently and also to play the violin. These were basic skills for an officer in the Austro-Hungarian Navy. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was his birthland and his first loyalty. And the Austro-Hungarian fleet had an interesting distinction. The man here you see on the left, this is Emperor Franz Josef. And this emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for years before World War I, was already being referred to in Vienna among the intellectuals. They jokingly referred to him as Franz Josef the Last because the empire was very much in decline. It was an old empire and a union of different religions, different ethnicities, different languages even. The crews that von Trapp commanded often had men in them who did not speak German, the dominant language of the empire and the official language of the Navy. Sometimes they had to be taught basic German in order to do their tasks. In fact, the famous song from the musical, The Sound of Music, Doe a Deer, a Female Deer, that taught basic music facts. The closest thing to this in the life of the real Von Trapp family children, they were taught songs that their father had used as uh, basic songs to teach German to sailors in the Navy who didn't know it. So the emperor is the emperor of Austria and the Austro-Hungarian Empire is a union. The Austrian emperor uh, is sort of co-ruler with the king of Hungary, which led to military units being designated Kaiserlich which means imperial, belongs to the emperor. You could have an army regiment, which was Kaiserlich, or Königlich, belonging to the king, royal. So you could have a royal regiment, which answered to the king of Hungary, rather than to the emperor of Austria. But naval units were both. They were Kaiserlich und Königlich. They answer both to the emperor and to the Hungarian king. And this is an important distinction to the men who look at themselves often as Austrians or Hungarians, and their loyalty is to the ruler of their own land. An interesting fact about that, you see here this man, I've already told you, is the emperor of Austria. Now, let me show you the king of Hungary. There he is. Right there, same guy, Franz Josef is both the Kaiser und the König. But to the men of the empire, the distinction exists. Now, von Trapp is a promising young naval officer and his first action will occur uh, in China, of all places. The first time that he gets decorated for valor, he is fighting against the forces of the Boxer Rebellion. A group of Europeans have been trapped in the city known then as Peking. 
And the siege of Peking is going to be relieved by a multinational force that goes together against uh, the rebels. And in order to get inland, they have to capture some forts called the Taku Forts. And Young Von Trapp, for the first, for his very first action, actually leads a landing party. He's leading a group of these Austro Hungarian Marines in the Boxer Rebellion against the Taku Forts. So, this again is one more thing that you're going to see when you get a glimpse of the man's uniform inside the wedding scene in the movie. And, you know, there are all these decorations on his chest. One of them represents his service as a young officer in the Boxer Rebellion. An important thing about Von Trapp that's going to be part of his career and sort, sort of define him, he's very, very loyal to old ideas. He's a very pious man. He takes his faith and his ethics very, very seriously. They're his guide to what's right and what's wrong. His hero is Franz Josef, the emperor. Von Trapp calls him the last knight, the last one to keep chivalry alive in the world, Von Trapp believes, is Emperor Franz Josef. And the things Josef believes and says and puts forward for the empire, Von Trapp con considers those to be uh, among the highest ideals. But while he himself is a very traditional man about how someone should act and which values he should hold, when it comes to technology, Von Trapp is actually right on the cutting edge. He's very interested in a brand new weapon. In the early 1900s, it's a brand new weapon. Uh, in fact, its first success had been here in South Carolina in the 1860s when the ship, the USS Housatonic, was sunk in Charleston Harbor by a brand new weapon. That brand new weapon was a submersible warship. And that submersible warship, uh, or a submarine, it was called in English, but in German, it was referred to as an Untersee boat. And this Untersee boat became shortened to U-boat. Well, here we have the first U-boat that Von Trapp commanded, uh, and it's not very big. That's not just the top of the craft sticking out of the water. It's pretty much the whole craft. Uh, the U-5 is very small, uh, still sort of experimental. And Von Trapp is excited about this weapon because it's kind of a defensive weapon. Remember, the Confederate submarine had been used to try to break the blockade in Charleston Harbor. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire feels that its sea routes could be blocked off by an enemy blockade. Uh, the English, they're not too worried about the English, but perhaps the Italians, their traditional enemies, could block up their ports. Well, they think if they have this new weapon, it could potentially break blockades. And the idea of using a U-boat to lay ambushes and, and to attack enemy shipping, that's still developing. But Von Trapp becomes very competent at the new weapon. And while he's at it, when the U-5 is launched in 1910, uh, there's a young lady there who breaks the bottle of champagne across the bow in order to christen the new warship. Uh, this is an old uh, maritime tradition. And the young lady who breaks that bottle of champagne, her name is Agatha Whitehead. That doesn't sound Austrian because it isn't. Agatha uh, is a young English lady. And as a matter of fact, her father was the inventor of the self-propelled torpedo. The British weren't very interested in that weapon. They liked their old uh, weapons and tactics better. But the Austro-Hungarian Empire was, and they paid for her father 
uh, Charles Whitehead to come to Austria where he worked on torpedo development and where his daughter would fall in love and marry uh, young Captain Georg von Trapp. So we see him in the movie, he's already got a bunch of kids. And of course the film portrays the big love story of his life being with Maria. But this was the mother of those seven children, Agatha Whitehead. And one writer about Von Trapp said that there were two great loves in Von Trapp's life, Agatha and the Austro-Hungarian Navy. And here we have him on SM-5, or U-5, it's sometimes called, uh, the little craft that he commanded. For an ambitious officer, this is a fairly small command, a fairly, fairly small crew, but working with a small, well-trained crew uh, seems to have been Von Trapp's preference. He didn't try to get into the bigger ships. He tried to learn more and do more with the brand new weapon. And here we have a close-up of the deck gun. Um, the new torpedo, of course, would be an important weapon for the submarine, but they were also uh, capable of surfacing and firing the missile. Both his bravery, but also his initiative in leadership would be really important to Von Trapp becoming a successful U-boat commander. Uh, and this is a pretty big moment for him. His craft is being inspected by his hero. That is the Emperor Franz Josef on an inspection tour of the units of his fleet. Because the Austro-Hungarian Empire becomes involved very quickly, uh, is actually right in at the beginning of what was then called the Great War. We know it as World War I. You might vaguely remember from classes in school, uh, it was an Austro-Hungarian arch Duke being assassinated by a Serbian that kicked off the events that would send the world to war. And naturally, as an Austro-Hungarian naval officer, Von Trapp went to war right away as well. And when he received his command, um, this is a terrific book, by the way, this is Von Trapp's own memoirs. It is called To the Last Salute. Uh, and only about 10 years ago did it become available in English. Uh, but he writes, uh, and by the way, the events in this book end long before the movie begins. Uh, the title of the book, To the Last Salute, refers to one of his ships renders the last formal gun salute that is ever given to the flag of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, because at the end of the Great War, that empire is not going to exist anymore. And he fires a final gun salute when the Austro-Hungarian flag is lowered for the last time. But in the book, he describes his new crew when he is assigned duties for World War I and a little speech that he gives them at the very beginning. Uh, he recognizes that many of these men are people he's actually worked with before in 1910 and before 1910 who were reservists. So they, they finished their duties with the Austrian military and then they went home and now they've been called back. And he writes about the minute comrades are all familiar. He, he calls them his comrades. He doesn't refer to them as his subordinates, even though he's in command, his first thought of them is that these are his comrades. And this is something you see again and again um, in his writing is the respect he gives to his subordinates. My new comrades are all familiar. Years ago in my U-boat, I sailed with some of these men. In the meantime, some had served out their time, been home, got married, and now stood before me not as young fellows, but as mature men. He's over 40 himself, which is quite old for uh, submarine service at that time. 
most important thing is we must be able to rely on one another. I must be able to trust you, and you must be able to trust me. If we are to be successful and want to bring our boat back safely every time, this depends on each one of us. It's a simple speech. Something you'll see as he writes about his men is how closely he pays attention to what they think, how they're acting. Uh, in one case, when a petty officer won't, uh, it seems to be holding something back, Von Trapp takes him aside and says, you need to speak freely to me about this. And they all come from different backgrounds. They speak different languages. Uh, Gumpold's Berger is a man he refers to repeatedly in the book, a, a petty officer of Borg. And although von Trapp never mentions it in the book, apparently in Austria, Gumpoltsberger is almost always a Jewish name. And this petty officer was probably Jewish. He's got Orthodox, Catholics, uh, Serbians, uh, Hungarians, uh, and Austrians aboard, but they all need to work together and they all do. Their first major success is actually one of the Austrian Navy's biggest successes of the entire war. It is the sinking of a French cruiser, the Leon Gambetta. Now this is quite a mismatch. His little craft is 105 feet long, about 260 tons. She has two torpedo tubes and a 37 millimeter gun. There are 19 men is in his entire crew. The Leon Gambetta, by comparison, is a 12,000 ton cruiser. And she has more than 800 men aboard. She's 12,400 tons. Uh, with 728 men aboard, I'm sorry, um, 728 men in the crew. She was carrying extra soldiers that night who were being trans uh, transported. But it's it's about you know more than 10 times his size. A very powerful war machine is the Leon Gambetta, and Von Trapp has been stalking this ship several nights in a row. And he gives an account in his book after two chances to attack the big French cruiser have been missed. Now, this is one of the most powerful naval weapons the French have in the Mediterranean. And they've missed opportunities twice. Now, he's gotten within range the third night in a row. And he writes, the cruiser comes about. If she bears away, everything is in vain again, but this time she approaches. Slowly, the picture in the periscope grows. I think I hear the rushing of the bow wake as the Colossus moves closer. Now a quick glance at the ship type. There is no doubt. Both torpedoes ready. And the last safety device of the projectiles is unfastened and ready comes back. In the periscope, I can see the cruiser's bow run through the crosshairs of the ocular, then the forward tower, the command bridge. Now the aft stacks come with the most vital part of the ship, the boilers. Starboard torpedo, fire. Then a quick turn and port torpedo, fire toward the forward stacks. I watch the trail of air bubble from my projectiles. They run in a straight line at 40 knots to their targets. At 500 meters distance, a big ship can no longer evade them. There, a dull, hard sound. After 10 seconds, a second one, as if a knuckle hit an iron plate, and a cloud of smoke shoots high up, far above the top mass. The men in the boat cannot hold back. Hurrah! Hurrah! Somehow or other, they must release the tension. I have difficulty penetrating their enthusiasm to get them to ready the reserve torpedoes. Perhaps the ship still requires a coup de grace. After the mortally wounded enemy, our U-boat crosses her path. The ship lists heavily on her port side and tries to put out lifeboats. A terrible state of affairs must be prevalent on board. 
The electric generators have stopped and the ship is completely dark. In the sudden sinister darkness down below, surely no one can find the closed bulkhead doors. The invading water, the slanting decks, the suddenly sloping ladders, the boilers, explosion, all that must spread confusion and mortal terror. No boats can be put out from the starboard side because the ship lists too much to port. Everything happens very quickly. The thin silhouette becomes noticeably smaller and then it too disappears nine minutes after firing. Our U-boat surfaces. Well, this is going to be a very, very costly defeat for the French. Out of 821 men on board, 684 will go down with the ship, including a French rear admiral, the commander of the cruiser, and every officer aboard the crew, officers in World War I, still believing that it was uh, the officer's duty, the commander of the ship's duty to go down with the ship. But apparently all the rest of the officers on board also gave preference to saving the enlisted men. So Von Trapp has done something which is, is astonishing uh, using the very primitive craft that he's got and matching it up very shrewdly using excellent tactics and leadership uh, to sink this enemy ship. But to him, that's not the end of the story. And you heard how he sort of visualized to himself how terrible things must have been aboard the ship itself. As a fellow sailor, he realizes how awful things were uh, and horrifying for the men aboard the ship he struck with the torpedoes. He expresses his anger that the French didn't send any escort vessels with the cruiser so that there's no one there to pick up survivors from the water. And in his book, he relates a little rant that he gave uh, to his second in command. Say, Seferditz, our job is horrible. We're like highwaymen sneaking up on an unsuspecting ship in such a cowardly fashion. Simply cold-blooded to drown a mass of men in an ambush. And the XO looks at him and says, uh, yes, sir. Well, Von Trapp hears something in his tone that makes him ask an extra question. He says, ah, no, don't give me yes, sir. Say something. And the XO reluctantly says, well, you're right, but there's more to our trade than life in the trenches or a torpedo boat. It takes nerves. Look, you have it better than the men and me. We know absolutely nothing about what is going on up there. We can see nothing. We only know that you are going for an attack. You have no time to talk. We have to read your facial expressions and infer what's going on. Treachery, couldn't we be torpedoed at any moment or run into minefields? They've laid nets against U-boats in the English Channel. Supposedly, they have sound apparatus to detect us. You know they're going to invent all sorts of things to make life harder for us. We are not a glory weapon. And Von Trapp listens and gets a new perspective on what life is like for the men he commands as well. And his compassion for and his understanding of his men is something that really, really flows through his book, including a number of humorous stories that he decides to tell about them. But this great victory results in his receiving the Order of Maria Theresa, uh, his knighthood, and being catapulted to being one of Austria's national heroes, the captain who sank the Leon Cambetta. Uh, he begins to receive fan mail, uh, as well as 
the rest of the crew. Letters and parcels arrive, he says, and we of men of you five swim in champagne and Dalmatian wine. Quoting one letter here, he says, um, under your imperial and royal command, the biggest French cruiser was sunk. We congratulate the great heroic exploit of the submarine U-5 with the wish that the victory banners of the submarines will flutter in the city of Vienna. With God for emperor and fatherland, every hand is raised in Austria. Yours respectfully, your well-wishing Viennese friend, an eighth grade schoolgirl. So the women are beginning too. I'm touched and order a Prugelkrapfen from the confectioner layman of Singerstrass to be delivered to the girl. He has her sent a cake. Well, the outcome of sending the cake to the little girl is that they begin receiving hundreds of letters from schoolgirls, all of them giving the same compliments and hoping for a similar cake. That's not the end of Von Trapp's war or his exploits. He goes on to command several submarines, including a captured French U-boat uh, against the Allies in the Adriatic and to command them successfully. But one thing that bothers him more and more, and here is a, a view, this is the entire crew of one of his submarines, not a very big bunch, as you can see, and from all different backgrounds, and some of them look less happy than others. Perhaps the sun's in their eyes, but another factor is that to his shock, not everyone is as loyal to the Austro-Hungarian Empire as von Trapp is. And while he expects that they are going to show the same loyalty to the empire that they show to him personally, it's just not true. They respect him as a leader and perform their missions very well indeed, but he is increasingly heartsick at the breakup of the empire and the fact that when his sailors leave, they go home to their own people, their own religion, their own ethnicity, and they're not really strongly in favor of keeping the empire itself together. At the end of World War I, von Trapp has become Austria's greatest hero. Uh, he wears the order of Maria Theresa. His story has gone nationwide. Uh, he is given the privilege of firing that last salute to the emperor's flag. But the end of World War I means that Austria loses its empire and loses its navy entirely. When the boundaries are redrawn at the end of World War I, what's left of Austria does not have a coastline whatsoever. They, have, they can have no ships, they can have no navy, and von Trapp has no job. He has no nobility, he has his family that he takes comfort in, and then before two years are out, Agatha has contracted scarlet fever and died. So Von Trapp has lost the things that are crucial to him. He has his children, he's lost his career, and he has lost his wife. And most folks would probably expect at that point that the, he's done making important decisions in his life. Again, he's not a young man. He was in his 40s when World War I broke out. He does take the time to write his memoirs in German. They're published in Austria, and they're a bestseller. His book, To the Last Salute, is widely read and actually becomes required reading for young Austrian officers. So apparently, his life has run its full course. And the reason that he's famous here has not even occurred yet. We see here a young, handsome, decisive, brave officer, well decorated for service. Um, 
another exploit that he had the first time a submarine sank another submarine in history was uh, Von Trapp's sinking of the Italian U-boat, uh, Niriaidi. And Von Trapp had won tremendous respect through the victories he won during what was a losing effort. This was something that I believe he had in common with this young man here. This young man from some years earlier had been the United States greatest war hero of the Mexican War, rose to command a few years later of the Army of Northern Virginia, the most famous Confederate army. This is Robert E. Lee, who after the surrender in 1865, remained an important leader. He had no army to command anymore, any more than Von Trapp had a ship. But he did have the respect of the people that he'd led. He was a hero to the South, as Von Trapp had become a hero to Austria. And both men didn't necessarily feel like they should be as admired as they were. However, both men understood that the respect they had earned, that the admiration that their regions gave to them was not just a privilege, it was a responsibility. That even though they'd suffered personal losses and national losses, and they'd each followed a flag that didn't wave anywhere anymore, even though they'd apparently lost everything, they still had to act with responsibility because many people looked to them for leadership. And that is what allowed each of them to make big differences after their wartime service. And you see both men here after their wartime service. What's going to happen with Captain Von Trapp? In 1938, an offer is made to him. And this is in the background of the film, The Sound of Music, but they don't give any background to the background. In the film, it's clear that the Nazis, uh, the German National Socialist Party, when they annex Austria and make it part of their new empire, the Third Reich, that they want Captain von Trapp. The film doesn't make it clear that he's not just another guy that they want. When the German Navy approaches on trap. What they're trying to do is get one of the greatest Austrian heroes and the greatest Austrian naval hero of the previous war to sign on with them. And what will happen to Von Trapp if he decides to take that offer? Well, Von Trapp was a man who really liked his decorations, his naval career, uh, the prestige and the honor and the respect that came with being a high ranking officer. And they're offering to give him all of that back and more. He's going to wind up almost certainly with a very high ranking position in the U-boat service and not a dangerous position. He's too old to be sent back to sea, but rather a job where people around him will be people from his own social class uh, many of them might even share his point of view about a lot of things. There were uh, a number of senior officers in the German Navy who weren't big fans of Hitler, for instance. He's going to be able to get back all of the prestige and to do things he enjoyed, like mentoring young officers and being on the cutting edge once more of new developments in submarine technology. So this isn't just a crude Nazi bribe. This is actually an offer 
that is as carefully targeted to Von Trapp as any Amazon advertisement. It seems to be offering everything he's ever wanted, including, including a new empire. And yet Von Trapp turns it down. Why? Well, the first and perhaps most important reason is simply his faith. Uh, remember Von Trapp believed that Franz Josef was uh, a perfect example, a emperor and also a good Christian knight. And that Franz Josef was a, a model. And one thing Franz Josef had been very publicly against and as an emperor had taken a stand against in Austria was anti-Semitism within his empire. He wanted to make it clear that Jews should be given the same rights and the same respect as anyone else in the empire. And he said that anti-Semitism was a deeply unchristian thing. Uh, and that was something that von Trapp also, uh, he expresses it indirectly in his book with his references to Gumpoltsberger, uh, but it was something that was part of his life and his code. Officers who joined the German Navy during the Nazi era were required to take the normal oath of allegiance to Germany and then another oath. The second oath was called the Fuhrer Oath. And they took an oath that they would be personally loyal to Hitler. This was something von Trapp would not do. And his response to the German offer was, oh, was I have only I have pledged myself to one emperor and that is all I will ever do. Von Trapp literally turned down an invitation to Hitler's birthday party which was both a prestigious uh, high class event to be invited to the top levels of society and also one would think a little dangerous to say no to. But he said no. And the first reason, as I mentioned, was ethics, his faith. The other reason, because there were men who felt like their best move would be, maybe I can change things from within or something like that. For Von Trapp, that's not an option because of his book. His book, To the Last Salute, had become required reading for young men who were gonna be officers in the Austrian military. He was deliberately being held up as a leadership model. That gave him a, a deep level, he thought, of responsibility. Because if he said yes to the offer, um, out of whatever motives, if he said yes to the offer, he would surely be held up by the Nazis as an example, saying, look, the great von Trapp, the man whose memoirs you were required to read in training, he has joined the Reich, he has put his loyalty with us. If he has put his loyalty with us, then you can tell that it must not be all that bad of a thing to do. And von Trapp is not willing to sign off because he knows even though he lost everything in the Great War, but his honor, he still has that, and it is still something of value, that his example is vital. So to learn more about Von Trapp, I suggest that you look for his book. You can find it out there today. You can even get it in electronic form. Uh, as I always say, when you see history on a video screen, whether it's a Hollywood movie or a big budget documentary or some guy from the museum talking on your computer. Always consider video history to be a commercial for good history books. And there's a great deal more you can learn about Von Trapp through reading his book. Uh, and I will mention before I go that his legacy is deliberately kept alive. In the modern Austrian military, uh, each class of graduating officers uh, chooses a symbol and not too many years back, 
the legacy of Von Trapp was honored by making him uh, the, the role model for another graduating class of officer. And it says, honorable to the death. Troy Bisson den Tot on the symbol that they chose. Okay, folks. Uh, just like Von Trapp's cruise, we were a um, small elite group today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute folks out there. Did anybody have any questions or comments uh, that they would like to add to today's session? I hope you're carrying away some, some good leadership thoughts with you today. I think they were that uh, studying great leaders uh, is an important way to develop your own leadership, which is something we all want to work on doing.